Live from New York, I'm Bonnie Quinn. And I'm Guy Johnson. This is Bloomberg Markets. We await the president speaking at the UN very shortly. We will bring that to you as soon as it happens. Well, in 2016, one of Wall Street's oldest boutique banks, PJ Solomon, entered into an alliance with French asset management giants Natixis. Since then, PJ Solomon has grown in prominence with CEO Mark Cooper leading the way. And guess who joins us now? Mark Cooper, indeed, along with, of course, Bloomberg's Shanali Basak. So, Two years ago, Mark, a 51% investment by Natixis. Why did you want this investment? So there are many reasons. I, th reasons. I think the, uh, the core reason is that uh, it was, uh, to us, a very exciting opportunity, very exciting partnership to continue to grow this storied franchise. And as you mentioned in your opening statements, uh, we are virtually the original independent investment bank, and to have an opportunity to build this for the long term was very important to all of us. Mm -hmm. There's been a history of European investment banks expanding in the U.S. with really mixed success. Why is this deal going to work out? So the reason why, uh, and we can talk about this across the M&A landscape, the reason why transactions don't work is cultures that don't fit. And particularly when you're talking about uh, organizations that are largely about people, when you try to put together a large European institutional uh, in, uh, commercial bank coupled with an entrepreneurially oriented investment bank, it doesn't work very nicely, particularly when the assets that you've purchased are people and that people leave. And we've seen it time and time again. It doesn't work. I have to say the folks at Natixis are pretty sharp guys and they've been around this before. And you mentioned in your opening sta statement that they have a very big asset management business. Interestingly enough, it's been built through a multi-boutique approach that allows them to maintain their independence and grow. You have some pretty ambitious expansion plans. How much do you expect to add to headcount over the next couple of years? It's considerable. Uh, they bought us as a platform. They loved our historical re uh, retail franchise. What they really looked for is a broad-based business across verticals that would match up best with their European clientele as well as their financing capabilities in the States. We've doubled in the two and a half years since the acquisition, uh, uh, up to 80 bankers, and I would expect over the next three to five years we'll double still. Why are Europeans really bad at investment banking? <laughs> Guy, you know you have to go back to London at some point, right? Yeah. But we are. Look, you can, you, can, you can basically add up. You put UBS, you put the Swiss banks, you put Deutsche Bank, you put the French banks, you, you put, put a whole bunch of other Euro, European banks together, and they still come up to half the value of JP Morgan. I, since the financial crisis, European investment banking has gone in one direction, and that has been south. It's a good question. Uh, and I don't know if it's about the European investment banks or European banks being bad investment banks. I think they're bad here in the U.S. Okay. Uh, and it goes back to, again, culture and how they operate. Uh, so there are two ways of going about this, as we've seen. One is just a de novo independent investment bank that is built in an entrepreneurial culture, or we've seen uh, longevity. We've seen banks that's built their culture across the universal yeah. spectrum of, of products delivered, J.P. Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. Those have hundreds of years of heritage and brand building and people building. And the U.S. is still the biggest M&A market, right? Yeah, I guess that's the point. Is that, but, but Europe is desperate to bring, to, to develop a capital markets story, and it, and it ain't there. So, so it, it, yes, and it's not, it, it's not going to be a European-centric business, my, my guess. It's going to be a global business, and that's what we're seeing, uh, and that's what we see with the Texas and part of one of the advantages that we have is now we have a global platform, which is unique for a boutique. Important, they didn't buy you, right? They took a 51% yeah. stake in you. Well, so why did you structure it that way? Well, it, interestingly enough, enough, when you go into a negotiation and you're both saying, I want this, and you want that, we both said we want the same thing. Uh, and what we wanted was a partnership. We weren't interested in giving up control, and they weren't interested in having us give up control. They knew, these are smart people, they knew the moment that we lost our entrepreneurialism, we lost our independence, was the moment that we wouldn't be as good as we've been for th 30 years. There's also been a proliferation of investment banks around your size. There's boutiques popping up left, right, and center. Is that driving up the price of bankers? Yes. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> no doubt about that. So, but where are you posting them from? So, so the question is, 
why are we getting them and also where are we getting them from? We get them from everybody. We get them from the universal banks, we get them from the boutiques, we get them from foreign banks. There are some good foreign bankers. Um, so the reason why they come to us is because we're unique and we're unique for a number of reasons. One, how many 30-year-old franchises are still at the early stages of growth? And that's a great thing because people, bankers are entrepreneurial but they're also risk averse. So having 30 years of doing great business is a good thing for bankers, but they still participate in the upside. Secondly, we've got Natixis, which gives us a suite of services that no investment bank, no boutique has. And then lastly, and I will say this, and it's true, and it might sound trite, we have a fantastic culture and we always have had one. So where are you seeing the activity right now? Where is it going to bubble up over the next six months, particularly given that the FOMC is going to raise again and we're not looking for that to slow anytime soon? I think it's a very active market across our sectors. I think you have two things going for you. You have uh, slow growth, uh, which will drive M&A activity, will drive strategic activity. Uh, and you have dislocation in some of the industries we bank. Such you know, as? Retail, uh, healthcare, uh, media, and communication. Okay, let's just talk about media. I, <coughs> yes, we got this deal over the weekend, Comcast buying Sky. And that valuation looked pretty punchy. Are we getting some deals being done right now that are indicating we're kind of near to the top of the market? I know there's still a lot of dry powder kicking around out there, but, but are, are we going to start to see people overpaying for assets? So... There's no doubt, and when people say, well, this cycle is different, it's always different. And yes, there will be overpaying, and yes, we will have a correction. I don't know if that transaction would suggest overcorrection. I think that transaction would suggest that the competition is coming from a lot of different places that was never seen before, and they need to do something to compete. Speaking of retail, right, we had a huge retail deal yesterday. I know that you've worked with the CEO of Michael Kors before. Is the same thing, overvaluation here? I mean, what's the rationale for a deal like that? We did see the price tumble as well. Yeah, it, so it's a long-term investment. John Idle, who I've known for quite some time and I think is uh, uh, a fantastic CEO and has done a, a, an incredible job building Michael Kors, the challenge you have with brands and the mistake people have made with brands is that there's a limitation. Once you go beyond a certain point, you lose what you, have, what you stand for. And frankly, it's not that you can't grow, it's that actually you shrink. Uh, so they recognize that, and I think what they said is, we've got a great business, it's going to create great cash flow, and we could reinvest it in some other brands that they can grow. Jimmy Choo they bought last year, and now Versace. And I'm not betting against John. Mm -hmm. okay. Mark, great to see you. Thanks for coming in to see us. It's been a real pleasure uh, and a real insight as well. I, I, they will let me back into Europe, I promise you. Uh, Mark Cooper, the CEO of PJ Solomon and uh, Bloomberg's Sonali Basak.